Thank you very much. We now move to uh, healthcare industry perspective. So this is uh, Dr. Pepper Denman, who is uh, Chief Medical Officer at G Healthcare and Covidian before that, and uh, but still keeps his hand in, in the clinic. He was telling me earlier. Thanks very much. Um, the escape to get to the... That was the extent of my technical ability. Um, Thank you very much for having me. Um, having watched the LCN over the last four or five years grow, it's been a real um, pleasure to be part of it. I've noticed that David Sarkis here and my involvement with the um, BioNano Consulting has been a, a, a great opportunity for me personally to, to see this growth. Um, I realize that you probably realize I'm the only American that's speaking today. Um, I have to apologize to UCL and Imperial. I actually did my clinical training at BARTS, which I realize is in another part of the world. And, um, but my daughter was born at UCL, so at least there's some ability to let me come in and talk. And one of the things I want to do while we talk is I'm going to try to wear several hats at the same time, and I'm sure that Professor Duke will have a probe to discover my schizophrenia once we do that. But I want to talk a little bit about being a practicing physician. I practice, I'm a pediatric anesthetist at Mass General Hospital um, about three or four times a month. Um, I still have a clinic on Fridays, and I did clinical research for the last 25 years and have kept some of my lab going, uh, mostly in drug research and things like that. And the other part of me, I actually run GE Healthcare's Medical and Clinical Affairs Division, which we're morphing GE into much more of a healthcare company as we go forward. And for those of you to give you a little bit of history about GE, the medical division of GE is the only branch of GE Healthcare that's actually based outside of the U.S. It's actually headquartered in Amersham. And for those of you who remember, Sir Bill Castell ran Amersham and they merged with um, GE and became GE Healthcare at that time back in 2004. Um, and, and that actually brought into GE Healthcare much more of a, an analytical part, the, the Watmans, the Amersham, the imaging agents. And we became in many ways much more of a traditional healthcare company now when we united that with our imaging devices. So the other thing about GE is a little bit of a history is uh, we're very proud of, of, of what we do in GE. Um, those of you who are aware of our General um, Research Council, which is headquartered up in New York, um, and also as we've grown across the entire world, we're sp still spending um, billions with a B. I realize it's thousands of millions here, but it's billions of dollars in basic research in General Electric across of course, all of our ranges, but one of the areas that gets a tremendous amount of that research is, is our medical division. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the areas we're looking at nanotechnology there. Obviously, the aviation division, the water, the lighting, the energy, all are focused um, on many aspects of nanotechnology. And one of the things that I'd like to, I'm going to ask this audience here for some help because I think everyone in this audience was born, which means, unfortunately, we have a fatal illness. And Many of us want to be a little bit like Woody Allen, who said he wanted not to experience immortality through his works, but through not dying. <laughs> and so when the National Institute of Health laid out their three bits <clears throat> of their nanotechnology, they actually said that we had to search out and destroy early cancer cells. We had to remove and replace broken cell parts with devices. And we had to deliver, develop and deliver implantable molecular pumps and drug delivery systems. That's a fairly tall order to be told that's what we have to do. But to me, that's the challenge we need to be thinking about. And I don't see nanotechnology, at least from my vantage point as a practicing doctor, as only the treatment of diseases. I think that nanotechnology has a real opportunity when I look around a room like this and what Gabriel has built at LCN, what our research people are doing in New York, to actually potentially not do what some of our previous researchers did. Um, for those of you who haven't read the book, there's a great book by Murkaji called The Emperor of All Maladies about cancer. And he talks about through the 80s and 90s how the clinician sat in one lecture theater at the major meetings and the basic researchers sat in the other and they didn't talk to each other. And yet we kept pursuing ways of giving more and more chemotherapeutic drugs and we kept digging deeper and deeper into the DNA of cancer. And what we actually found out was cancer was us, oncogenes and proto-oncogenes and the 
elimination of the DNA of the suppressor bits, in particular the retinoblastoma gene. So they were over there experimenting with that. Now, over in this group, cis platinum was being developed and methotrexate and all those things, but they weren't talking. So how do we at nanotechnology actually say we can maybe avoid that going forward? How do we figure out ways to prevent the disease, work on the treatment, and start talking at the very basic levels? So how do we break down our silos of research? That's one area where I would really like to think that we have the ability to move forward. So when we talk about, let's see if I get this right, nanomedicine, we want to talk about monitoring. And this is my request to all of you, monitoring, control of drug delivery and disease therapy, repair, tissue engineering, and then the processes and the ways that we can do nanoassemblers. <coughs> The person who came up with the word gray goose says he regrets ever having said it. Obviously, that's not what we're talking about here. But in monitoring, we've discovered those. I'm going to use a few examples as we go through the talk to come back and try to bring us back to this as we get to the end. But the areas we want to talk about, obviously, there's cancer. Obviously, there's developing better um, mechanical implants. Obviously, there's better ways of sensing. In other words, you know, there's the hypothetical story that you go for your physical, those of you who are over 50 are getting to do it more often now. And so rather than having some of those very unpleasant gifts that we get on our 50th birthday in medicine, maybe we can just put our piece of blood on a chip and our doctor can say, you know, I, I see a, I picked up a little precancerous thing from your colon. We're going to give you a little vaccination because somebody in this room has actually come up with a way to say, hmm, we saw that gene that was missing from you, or you have a vaccination that we need to give you, or we need to implant another bit of your chromosome 22 that's going to stop you getting CML or whatever we're talking about. That's where I believe we need to be thinking about where we're going. So as we're looking at nano developments in, in development in our um, world, and Mike, I see you here. I'm going to, I barred shamelessly from your slides to make an example. Um, we're looking at some of the stuff we're looking at at GE Healthcare. What are we looking at? We're looking at things that we use super paramagnetic iron oxides. We're looking at dendrimers. We're looking at fluorines. Um, for instance, gadolinium. Gadolinium was thought to be an incredibly benign imaging agent for many, many years. It turned out that once we'd given it 10, 20, 30 million times, there were a group of patients who had renal disease. People who had renal failure ended up getting a terrible illness call sclerosing, ne nephrogenic sclerosing fibrosis ended up being fatal, and it was because the gadolinium hung around in their tissues. If we can bind it into a buckyball type scenario of fullerene, we can administer it. We get much better penetration, but we also <coughs> protect it from um, the side effects there. We're looking at liposomes and emulsions for our magnetic resonance stuff, for our CT scans and our ultrasounds, and as we said, we're looking at our super paramagnetic iron stuff. So diagnostic imaging. Why is it so important? It's terribly important because both nanotechnology can make my screens better. I can have a better view. It also allows me to, to track the patient. And if we think about this, if we think about incidence versus prevalence, and one of the areas where we're very focused is not just using imaging for diagnosing, but using imaging for monitoring, using imaging for tracking our therapies for multiple diseases, but not just cancer, not just the shrinkage of a tumor, but Alzheimer's, plaque formation, the molecular imaging that shows me how things are working. So right now, what can I see? I see an organ level, and I see information on anatomy and structure. My contrast agents can stop the x-rays or make them light up or change the way the radio frequency in T1 and T2 type processions from MR give me my radio frequency response. What do I want to see? I want to see things where the contrast agent binds with the disease cell. I, I hate to use the word theranostics. It's a terrible, terrible word, and we laugh about it all the time. But one of the things is, wouldn't it be wonderful if we tag an antibody to the imaging agent to also to the therapeutic regimen? And then what happens is that it eventually finds the cancer. It binds to it. But if it doesn't find the cancer, it doesn't split off. If it doesn't split off, the imaging agent is not released. If the imaging agent isn't released, it doesn't light up. So I stop giving you your chemotherapy. I don't keep going when you don't need it. So as we look at the signals, as we look at the ligands on the target, and like I said, this is, this is a challenge to this audience to help us pull back to where we need to be focused on where we're going. 
So why do I want to have nano? It improves my signal. Signal, specificity, sensitivity. I stop my treatment when I finish. I continue treating when, I, when I'm going on. One of the classic examples is, a, is in the treatment of cancer where in Cori, how do you get it right? In chorionic gonadotropin carcinomas. One of the treatment paradigms that the guy was laughed out of the room for was he continued to treat based on a blood level. He, it looked like it was gone. When they did the imaging, they couldn't see the tumor in the women. Very rare tumor, which made it, um, which meant that the, the signal to noise ratio was very good. Rare tumor, rare treatment. But what he did is he kept treating based on the blood levels. And lo and behold, his patients did much better than the others. So if we come up with a way to absolutely target our imaging, then we can continue to treat the patients, your mothers, your fathers, your children, based exactly on where we need to be with the treatment. That's one of the reasons why the sensitive specificity of the imaging is so important. And then how do we also control our biodistribution? Well, toxicity. If we can get the right size, bioavailability and biodelivery, we're going to be able to target blood-brain barrier. We're going to be able to Alzheimer's. Could we get drugs by encapsulating them through the blood-brain barrier based on the size of the actual agent we're using. We're just about to re release this into um, what we call it, to our businesses at GE, where they're going to start work moving forward on the development here, trying to use the super paramagnetic iron oxide nanoparticles in our MR machines. Um, it's moving from our GRC. One of the things, I just digressed it, one of the things that we actually focus on very much in the commercial side of the world is Somebody who's responsible for the checkbook has to step up and say they want to fund it. So even though it's a great technology, we have to have a pull. We have to, have, we have to be answering a solution-based medical question. So this is one of those where we feel that we're going to go forward with this technology. So we have the super paramagnetic oxide, old core, the water solubility, and what we end up doing is we're actually getting better pictures in our basic science research on using this, and we have a high MR signal, it biodegrades very quickly, we have a flexibility in our coding chemistry, and we have new indications in our vascular immune cell imaging. And as we look here, we actually found that with the blood flow, we can actually get with our functional blood volume, we actually can show better pictures of the blood flow to the tumor, which helps us elicit um, <coughs> tumor growth, tumor blood flow, and angiogenesis in our imaging. Now, why also do we need nanotechnology? One of the comments that came up in the meeting today that particularly resonated was a timeline. For those people who are involved in the development of drugs, one of the things that desperately is needed by drug development is shrinking the timeline. It's 12 to 17 years, as everyone in this room knows, to get a clinical or a new moiety through clinical testing. Right now, it's about $800 million to develop a drug. That's a lot of money in any book. Um, you know, a billion here, a billion there, and pretty soon it's real money. But $800 million per drug you bring to market is a lot of money. So how can we take the 5,000 we see that only get to 12 that go to clinical trials? How do we leverage what we can do in this room to help us get these drugs to market. These are drugs that are already being used in microtechnologies and already, we're already out there. So as we begin to run through our tests, as we begin to have DNA compositions and we look at the, the effect of the drugs, how does it, so my challenge is how do we help humanity in many ways get our drugs to market faster, cheaper, and in many ways better? So. What also do we need? Diagnostics, lab on a chip. We've got a micro system here. How do we now move on to the, mic to the nano level, which um, Professor Duke talked about. I'm not going to go into the way it works, just the point that this is absolutely critical to us being able to diagnose our patients earlier, in the precancerous stages, in the pre-diabetic stages before it happens. How do we get closed loop, wearability, rapid response? Diabetes. Everyone knows that glycemic control is good. Everyone knows the tighter we get it, the better. How do we make sure we begin to show that and elicit this? Tissue engineering. What happens when we put an implant in? Well, the implant takes the load so the, implant, so the bone stops moving. How do we figure out ways to manage those stresses, cause appetite to be released, stop the body reacting to the thing? 
All of these are possible through the technologies we have. I'm going to show one. I'm not going to talk about cantilever technology. That's not my forte. What I am going to tell you about is why I was so impressed with, with what happened with the Rita vaccine. MRSA, terrible condition, awful disease to have. Targanta develops the drug, but there's not, the mode of action isn't understood. Steps in the LCN, and they figure it out for the team. Use their micro cantilevers, look at drug binding, which of course will have many, many other areas in drug development, elucidated how the action worked, demonstrated how it differed clinically from vancomycin, which is a terrible drug. Those of you who've either had vancomycin or seen a friend have it or have used it know it's not a very nice drug. It takes weeks and weeks of treatment. So the work was done here by this team. Now, why am I interested in it? I'm interested in it because my wife happens to be the Vice President of Medical Affairs and Head of Competitive Strategy of the Medicines Company, which bought the drug based on what this team did. Thank you very much for that. But the point I'm making is it really does matter what you guys are doing, what we're doing in nanotechnology, how we work together to actually make the patients better. Because right now it looks like that as we're going into phase 2B and phase 3 trials with this particular drug, which got a new lease on life directly because of what was done by the LCN, was one shot, one and you're done is this tag phrase. You get one dose of it and it gets rid of your MRSA. If that's the truth, we have a tremendous opportunity there to change the way people are treated with. So one of the things I just also want to challenge us about is we look at healthcare and from the healthcare perspective is how do we make sure that the haves and the have-nots in the world develop and benefit from this? How do we make sure that the developing nations and the developed nations work together to address the real issues we've got? TB is not a problem here, huge problem in the rest of the world, etc. What diseases do we face? People have brought up that if we're getting rid of wrinkles, maybe that's not the first place to start. And the other thing is that I would say is that I think that there's the real ability from nanotechnology to bring us, to actually focus some of us Western-facing physicians and treatment paradigms back into the real prevention area. Because to me, we need to start figuring out how, what causes the disease using this technology. So thank you very much.